Chris Lee, Blaine Gilmer, and Blake Lovell here from Southeastern 14. Continuing our preview series of SEC football teams, today we get to the Vanderbilt Commodores. Blake, you and I both live in the Nashville area. That was an ugly season for the Commodores a year ago. I think things will be a little better, but my goodness, Vanderbilt has had some bad football teams, but I think what Derek Mason got left was the worst one in a couple of decades. I think Clark Lee has done a good job trying to climb out of that hole, but man, that was a hole. Yeah, um, I, I'll kind of say what I said, and I think when we were talking about their was it their week one game against Hawaii, we did our prediction video for that, and I kind of said I think they'll be better this year. I think they'll be improved, but I don't know what that looks like from a win total standpoint. You know, it's it's one of those where if you really look hard, I think you'll see some improvement in certain areas, um, but there will still be compared to many other SEC teams, there will still be large deficiencies, you know, that, that will be on display in those SEC games. And I think that's the thing is you'll see them get better. Um, I, I don't know, again, what that looks like from a, a scoreline standpoint. And we'll talk about their their win total and those kind of things um, at the end of the video. But that that's the, that's the only thing. Like you said, if you're Clark Lee, you're still – this is a long-term play here. This is not any sort of short-term play. And by long-term, I mean – what Chris I mean we're talking five years here like I, I truly yeah. believe that and I know no one wants to hear that but I think we're talking several more years before he has the roster the way he wants it and um I think at this point that's all you can do you can just take it one step at a time one year at a time you try to get better each year you know what you're going up against and that that would be my expectation I think they'll be better I don't know that it shows up in the win total but I think they'll be better skill wise um how much better I don't think it's drastic, but but I think they'll be better. Remember, in time, Vanderbilt will be the best team in college football. That's what Clarkley said at SEC Media Days. So no disrespect there from him. That that was, <laughs> that was we talked about Media disrespect. Days. And, uh, that is a direct quote. Yeah. Uh, but hey, one thing Vanderbilt's doing right—they got a Georgia boy at quarterback in Mike Wright. And, you know, that's that's yeah. a positive. That's a trend up in the direction. You got a quarterback <laughs> from Georgia. So there you go. One who can run, too, which which Absolutely. he will be a handful in, in certain ways. We'll get to that later. Yeah, I mean, the, the talent gap for them, you guys, you guys saw them a year ago. And you could see it the latter years of Derek Mason. There was nothing he could do a, about it a year ago. They were just slow across the board. Uh, and, and as much as speed was a problem, the trenches might have been even worse. I mean, they just – they do not have SEC-level linemen now – he is starting to get athletes uh, that can come off the edge, uh, like we've talked about this pre pocket the nine sacks a year ago. Somehow they had yeah. 13 interceptions with nine sacks. I don't know how you do that, but they did. <laughs> it was um, about Trevon Walker had six from Georgia himself. Right. So when you think about the entire team only had nine for a year, that's that's the comparison you make right there. Yeah. Right, and, and Trayvon Walker did it in, in, in a few – fewer snaps than the entire Vanderbilt defense did. Yeah. But well, Will Anderson in Alabama has 17 and a half. I was gonna say, yeah. We, <laughs> yeah. we were talking about we just did our Georgia preview. We were just <laughs> thinking we were like when when Blaine said it in the Georgia preview, I'm like, okay, Walker had six, but he wasn't even like <laughs> yeah. that wasn't even compared to the other guys. Like it's so th that's we're not laughing at Vanderbilt. It's just that again. It it, that, it, it was it was out, bad. Right? That stands well, out. I mean that's yeah. So I think this is hard for people to believe, but from what I've the, the culture was as big a problem as the talent. I, I don't think those kids had any confidence. I don't think they had the right work ethic. I, I don't think they had the right organization. I, it really is a total tear this thing down to the studs and knock some of the studs down too and, and rebuild this thing. I mean, I, I guess if you want to look for positives from a year ago, Vanderbilt was in some games late, had South Carolina beaten. Uh, with two minutes left, gave Carolina the ball back inside its 10. Carolina drove the length of the field with the quarterback, taking his first snap that game and, and won that. They had Missouri close with a couple minutes left. Played Kentucky to 14 points, although it wasn't as close as the score indicated. Um, I, I did see them a good bit this spring. They are faster, but the, the, the speed is coming a lot of times in youth. You're not going to win in this league with freshmen and sophomores. So th this is one of these seasons – I'll get to expectations later because I've got a, a different way to, to frame it maybe. I'll wrap it up there. But um, Blaine, you mentioned Mike Wright. He's, for the time being, beating out Ken Seals. 
He is the fastest of their options. He's a 10, 800 meter guy. They spent a lot of spring trying to teach him, don't just go in straight lines, try to weave a little bit. And I had some success with that um, because last year it was all straight line. And, and sometimes he did win foot races that way. They've got Ray Davis back, who is a good running back for them. Uh, had a nice career at Temple, was never healthy last year, was out after three games, and even when he played, he wasn't healthy. They've got some respectable guys behind him. I, I think that the way this team is built and, and their receiving core is, is a concern. They got Will Shepard, who's a good player. They got Ben Bresnahan, another Georgia kid who's talented, uh, has got a chance to have a nice year. But I, I think their bread is probably going to be buttered in the running game. And if you can slow the game down and control the clock, and you've got a mobile quarterback who can convert third and threes at third and sevens, you know, one drive at a time, maybe Vandy yeah. finds itself at some games that we're not expecting. Yeah, I think I think to your point, you said culture – I think year two of Clark Lee in terms of that and some some belief uh, in, in, in what they're doing, maybe not necessarily showing a belief in the results that we're getting, but the belief in the process of what we're doing day in and day out. And then the alignment that's going through there in, in Vanderbilt that I think is is starting to be, become you know refreshing because they've got a general manager there in Barton Simmons who – knows that recruiting industry in a different way than a lot of people do with his background of uh, being a, a, a recruiting analyst uh, from his time at 24-7 sports, things like that. So when you talk about that, I think finding the talent that they that they are because they know the challenges that they that represent that that are presented to them in terms of recruiting in the first place, but being able to bring in the guys that they have on on the trail. You and I, Chris, you know, with with what we do at Rivals, we see that hey, they're they're actually winning some battles uh, for for recruiting. So I think you're seeing brick by brick a little bit of belief um, being in there. But I I agree with you, Mike Wright. I think he's going to be able to to have some exciting plays uh, made for Vanderbilt this year and if he can uh, sprinkle in like you said just a couple key third downs sometimes that's all it takes to to change the momentum of a game yeah I mean I you know uh, I probably not a lot to say outside of what's already been said but I mean I guess as you talk about Chris the strength of the the offense will be the running game probably I think it's just it's always the question of you know well, in the passing game, it's will you be able to actually get passes off? But I think him having the speed that he has, that will help prevent some of that. Um, when we talk about pass rush or some of the teams in the SEC and such, but I think it's still the same thing. You know, it's the running game is going to be your strength, but you know, when you're going up against teams that you feel like are going to be more talented than you, may jump out to a big start. You know, let's say you get out 10 to nothing five minutes into the game. It's those kind of things. And we've seen what, that with Vanderbilt over the years, right? You've had to, you're playing from behind a lot. And that's where we've always talked about it, but it's like the running game has always been there. And yes, it's, it's always given them a chance in some years, but it's, to me, it's still the thing where if you just, you've, you've got to have a competent passing game if you're Vanderbilt every year, because if you don't, you know, you're going to be in some of those positions where you are going to be playing in Alabama. You are going to be playing in Georgia. And oh, by the way, they're both on the schedule this year where, you know, if you're having to play from behind, we're not saying they're going to win those games, but that's something where I think you've got to have sort of that that aspect, and I still just don't know if they're going to have that from a passing standpoint, and that's why, like we said, if you can't just run the ball the whole game, if you're, you know, you're down two, and, two touchdowns, 14 points, 17 points, you're trying to get back in the game, those are the questions I think we've always had, but I think I'm curious to see how that plays out from that standpoint. So, Well, you raise a good point. I'd have to look up the stat. They gave up touchdowns on first drive something like 10 times it was crazy right. Blaine you remember the Georgia game Georgia yeah. had them I think 35 nothing at the end of the first quarter like yeah. that's that's where they've got to be better on first drives they've got to probably control the clock because I, I really don't know that they're going to be able to throw the ball their offensive line is a huge question mark their left tackle Tyler Steen who frankly wasn't very good at Vanderbilt is now Alabama's left tackle yeah um you know, they've got some good young players they like there, but good young is, is the operative phrase there. Um, and that gets you in trouble more often than not in the league. But I, I think that's the thing that they've, they're going to have to be able to throw. And I think between their protection and what still is a lack of SEC speed at receiver, that's where it's got potential to get really ugly pretty quickly for them on offense. 
Yeah, you mentioned that Georgia game. I think the the biggest thing that you see is we talked about it in our Georgia preview, Jalen Carter, right? And uh, Jalen Carter literally about decapitated a young man uh, in the back in the backfield back there. And the reason is is because literally Georgia was able to, you know, defensive coaches talk about all this all the time in clinics and things like that. They were able to replace the line of scrimmage, right? They were able to take that. Vanderbilt offensive line and put it a yard, two yards back, right at the the snap of the ball because of the the physicality, uh, the the size, you know, difference, things like that. So I think as you get some more beef up front through recruiting, through the transfer portal, things like that, that's what's going to ultimately it it starts up front. And that Mike Wright can be as good as he wants to be, uh, Davis can be as good as he wants to be, you know uh, the a tight end can be as good as, as he wants to be, but if you don't have the offensive line uh, to, to make it go, that's where it all starts. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think that's the thing, Chris, when we, we talk about this, I, I, I've said it, like I just have, obviously I have questions on both sides of the ball and we are about to transition to the defense, but I think just that for me offensively is what would still concern me is uh, as like I said to you in our, our schedule preview or whatever's our week one preview we did. You know, anytime you're still bringing up accuracy issues with your quarterback, you're mentioning, yeah, he's got the speed and all this other, but it's still, you still keep going back to the accuracy. And as we said, it's just, that's been something we we've talked about a lot over the years with Vanderbilt. And that is still something where if they're in situations where they're playing from behind, which they're absolutely going to be, um, I just think having a more competent passing attack and we'll see, maybe it, you know, exceeds expectations. But um, I think that's certainly one of the biggest questions I would have going into the season. Well, you, you led me into a really good next point. And I've got the, the world's loudest dog barking outside my door here. I don't know if that's making its way onto the audio. But Vanderbilt's got one defensive lineman over 300 pounds. Yeah. Usually not going to cut it in the SEC. That's Malik Langham, who was a transfer from Florida where he wasn't playing. They spent their spring with Davion Davis, who's probably their best defensive lineman out. They Clifton, who was – uh, they're in last year, I think led them in snaps defensively. He was out and we, we noted they had nine sacks last year and, and they had, you know, Devin Lee, who's a backup for them is going to play a lot. That, that three key defensive line out, there wasn't a lot of a pass rush and still completions were an issue uh, a lot of times. And so that I think they're going to have to find quick hitters, Ben Bresnahan, I think, is going to be a bigger guy in this offense. If, if they've got a breakaway threat, it's it's Will Shepard. But back to defense, uh, I, I just think that they're in really bad shape along the trenches. Now, where I think they can compete with some other SEC teams in terms of what they have is, is linebacker. Anthony Orgy and Ethan Barr both getting a little bit of run as NFL draft prospects. Orgy's been on several second, third team all SEC teams. They brought in Kane Patterson from Clemson, who I think can help them. He's probably faster than what they've got there. They've got some depth there. they got a kid named Ricky Wright who hit the portal until he didn't. He's probably their most talented defender. There, there are some building blocks there, uh, but, but it's going to be tough when most of them aren't along the line of scrimmage. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you talk about linebackers, you know, one thing that made – Obviously, you know, you look at some of the great linebacking cores out there. What makes them really good, Chris, is that they're getting blocks held up in front of them. And again, you talk about the 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 line of scrimmage. If if you're undersized at defensive defensive tackle and you're not able to, you know, eat up double teams, then those linebackers aren't able to use that athleticism and run freely to to make tackles. So, um, you know, that may be the strength of the team with, with Orgy and Barr and Patterson and all, and, and uh, Dericky Wright, but it, it could be counterbalanced by the lack of lack of girth up front, if you will. Yeah, and I mean, I, that's the things we're talking about, right? It's, you know, size and speed. Like we, we know, SEC-wise, those are – two very important things. And as you've said many times, Chris, that's just still a situation where you're, you're playing from behind and you're at a disadvantage. And until those things can kind of get back to where they need to be, I just think this will, you know, you can kind of rinse and repeat on these kind of things. It's just, are they going to have enough speed on both sides of the ball? Obviously we talk about defense and being to be able to create havoc and, and get, you know, picks, because like we said, we don't know about the pass rush and those kind of things. Um, you've got to find a way to, as we mentioned, offensively, if we're talking about the deficiencies they have there on defense, 
the way to make it easier, right, is to to force the other team to make mistakes. And that is where we've seen, too, when we talk about it, Chris, right, like over the years, the Vandy teams that have exceeded expectations, I think, have done one thing in particular, and that's they've changed the landscape of, of a single game with their defense and forcing turnovers and those kind of things. It makes it easier on their offense when you know that they, you know, are playing at a disadvantage there as well. So I think that's something – it's going to be so important that they have to be able to help the offense out. And I think if, if the defense can do that, then we're talking about a situation where maybe that progress speeds up a little bit, not to the point to where, you know, they're going to be competing for a bowl game. I don't think or anything, but um, that to me is like, that is one of the top things this season. If they're going to be better, especially in the win win column, if they're going to win maybe a game they shouldn't or something, it to me, it's all got to come from forcing those mistakes on the defensive side. Can they do that? We'll see. Well, and, and to that, one guy I forgot to mention, Jalen Mahoney, who's been their nickel, was probably their best player in spring, and has picked up a few passes in his career. Uh, I'd say he's a dark horse candidate to get four or five picks. I'm not going to predict it, but like if you're going to pick an off-the-radar guy that you could see getting some love in, in the postseason, he, he might be one to watch. But guys, the, the talent is just – the gap between them, even in Missouri, which I would say is probably the 13th team in the league, uh, is still pretty substantial. Uh, th- that that said, they played Missouri tight a year ago. Again, that that was a game with five minutes left that anybody had a chance to win, from what I remember. Um, you know, and, and Vanderbilt has shown a tendency to hang in there. I do think this will be a more disciplined team. I, th- I think the culture over there, from everything I've heard, has gotten better. Blaine, really good mention uh, with Barton Simmons, a guy we both know and respect. And one other thing, I, I don't think this is public knowledge, but they have committed about $300 million to improving their facilities, which everybody knows need improvement. Yeah. I've heard privately that number is closer to $400 million. I think at Vandy, uh, the, the academic side over there is just not very pro sports, and they've got to be careful about advertising it, which is probably why you've not heard it. But definitely a rebuilding year. Uh, Blake, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the over under on wins for them has been about two and a half where I have seen it. Yeah, I, I think probably two and a half to three is going to be the number you're going to see the most on that. Um, because like we said in our schedule preview, and, and as we've talked about, we, we will we'll link our schedule preview in the description here so you can check out our breakdown of their schedule. And Chris and I have already done the week one preview for the Hawaii game. Um, I mean, we said it, Chris, like it's a situation where if you're Vanderbilt – to get that win total you need, right? We usually talk about how important those non-conference games are. And this year's no different. When you look at their mm-hmm. schedule, they're at Hawaii versus Elon versus Wake Forest at Northern Illinois. We know right off the bat, they're not going to be the favorite in the Wake Forest game. Um, I'd be surprised, right? I think we can all agree on that. I, I don't see them mm-hmm. as the favorite in that one. You know, Chris, we talked about that Northern Illinois game. Um, I mean, what it's on the road, right? And, and I've, it's one of those games where it's just like, I don't know what the setup will necessarily be heading into that game. It, it will all depend on those first three games. Um, so beyond that, I guess, you know, let's, let's have the discussion sec wise. Um, Missouri, I just, <laughs> that's it. Right. I, I mean, that's it. Missouri on the road, I think is your only true opportunity because here's the thing, right. And let's be honest, and Chris, we've, we've talked about this ad nauseum. Blaine knows this too. When we're talking about Vanderbilt, you're not getting the home games, even if they say home games, right? And that's the, that's the issue when you're looking at it because you know you're going to be outnumbered when Ole Miss comes to town, when you know Tennessee comes to town, when Florida comes to town. Those are basically away games. Yes, you're in your own venue. You get to sleep in your own bed, all this other stuff. But fan-wise, atmosphere-wise, you don't get that bump that other teams get You know, in these big, high-powered SEC games. Um, so that's another thing you have working against you. So if you're to me, I think if it's two and a half, I would go over, but in all honesty, I'm not going above three because I think the three would have to be Hawaii, Elon, Northern Illinois. I think the other games are just going to be a challenge. So, yeah, I I think three is, I I hate to say the ceiling because you never know if they, they slip up and get Missouri again, they did play Carolina down to the, the final few seconds a year ago, I, I think that one will be a different outcome this year. Although it will be in Nashville, but I mean, you mentioned that. that okay, here's here's what's crazy. We're talking about an SEC team 
And I know Vanderbilt fans hate to hear this, uh, but but that's not our audience here. Our audience is the SEC. I'm trying to think of uh, places they'll go where, where they games they have where they will not be in a in a very hostile environment. Hawaii is going to see about nine thousand people. But I had a nephew that played in the WAC until last year, or excuse me, the Mountain West, and and they'll they'll get into you a little bit down there. I went to Northern Illinois to watch him play. They had a game. Last year he played at Wyoming. The stands weren't half full in what's not a big stadium. So that'll be one where it's not going to be everybody's against you. And and Wake will be one in Nashville where Wake is not going to bring a lot of people. Those other nine games, man, they, they may be outnumbered even in their own building, which is a depressing place to be. But that's 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 kind of what Vanderbilt has wrought over the years. But um yeah, but back to the the over unders and wins, Blake. I, I think Hawaii they've got to get that one. Elon week two they got to get. Um, and Northern Illinois may may be the swing game of the year. Then you know, maybe three and zero you're getting a little confidence. Maybe you got some power to win some games that, that nobody's expecting. I don't I don't see it. We're throwing out all the possibilities, but I think I think September is very important for this team. Yeah. Um, I think Missouri is the only one SEC wise I'm looking at right now, unless South Carolina goes in reverse. And I just don't see it. We, we, I think we're all in agreement that Shane Beamer is going to have South Carolina continuing to move in the right direction. They've got a new quarterback. Um, yeah. And look, like we said, if you've heard everything we've said in the first 20 minutes, we're not, we're not saying anything that's going to surprise you and, or be demeaning towards Vanderbilt. It's just, this is the state of where things are. And when you look at their schedule, I think that's, Look, it's it's never easy if you're Vanderbilt playing an SEC schedule, but as all of us know, when you have both Alabama and Georgia on the schedule, um, your mm-hmm. strength of schedule rating is going to jump up dramatically. And for Vanderbilt having to play both on the road, not that they were games you would win if they were in Nashville, but um, yeah, that's gonna that's gonna bulk up your your strength of schedule. Which I think Chris top five Phil Steele had it. I want to say it was number four, maybe five. Yeah, number five. Okay, so. So there you go. You're already having kind of an uphill battle. Your schedule is top five in the country. Not ideal. Okay, I'm going to throw one thing at both of you guys. What's success for Vanderbilt look like this year? I mean, for, forget breaking even. That's not going to happen. Uh, I got my I, answer. I think, I, think, I think in four wins would be coach of the year material. My, my answer is win two to three games – and have two more games, whether that's against Wake, whether that's against – I would say two SEC games, although you could throw Wake Forest in there because Wake Forest is is a top 40 team this year too, according to most people. I think the number of wins plus the number of games that they take an SEC opponent midway through the fourth quarter with a fighting chance to win, if that number equals five, whether that's three wins – and two times they have near misses against SEC teams or two wins and three near misses. To me, that's a success. What do you guys think? Go ahead, Blaine. I'll give you mine in a second. Yeah, I just think that you have to look for those incremental, you know, victories, right? Not the not the overall, you know, wins, but you got to look like, okay, uh, we we played a lot better on the offensive line this game. We We didn't have as many, you know, scheme you know bust things of that nature so that's gonna be a lot of stuff that the coaches grade and coaches see but in terms of people can judge i just think other than the obvious games the alabamas the georgias you know be be at least in contention in the second half of every game don't be just if it's not over at halftime hey you're 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 doing a good job i will piggyback on that because it's kind of what i was going to say i think you i think you win the games you're supposed to win because that's the problem with Vanderbilt over the years, isn't it, Chris? Where you lose those games and all of a sudden your season completely changes because that just – those are the games you're supposed to win. Like you have to beat the Hawaii's. You have to beat the Elons. Um, like we said, you feel like you should be able to beat North Illinois, Northern Illinois if you've you know gotten off to a good start, you're, you're doing some things well. I think that's the big start. You, you, you beat the teams you're supposed to beat. But then it's, it's what Blaine said. I think it's when you get to those final four SEC games – South Carolina, Kentucky, Florida, Tennessee. I think it's, are you better than you were? And I know it's going to be hard to gauge, right? Because you're playing Alabama and Georgia in two of your first three SEC games. You got Ole Miss in there. Those first SEC games are just absolutely brutal. I can't imagine there's a tougher stretch for anyone else in terms of three games. But 
it's that where once you get to that, and of course that's coming off the Missouri game, right? We can even throw that in. I think it's just, are you competitive? That to me is the big thing is, are you getting more competitive as the season goes along? Even if your schedule, you know, Tennessee's going to be tough at that last one and you may get beat by whatever, but are you competitive in those games where you have a shot against Missouri? You got a shot maybe going into the fourth quarter against a South Carolina at home. Um, you know, maybe not going to be the situation in some of the other games, but that to me, I think is success is you might go get beat 60 to nothing in Alabama. You might get beat 60 to nothing at Georgia, but can you, can you turn around and like turn that into going to Missouri and being, having a chance to win going to the fourth quarter and those kind of things. I think that double whammy beat the teams you're supposed to beat in the non-conference, at least be competitive as the season's going along, going into that final stretch. That to me is probably the, the a good way to, to measure your success for this season. Yeah, I mean, Blaine, parting thought. We again, this is just not to not to sit here and bang on Vanderbilt, but that Georgia game last year. Now, granted, Georgia was elite, but the gap between them and Georgia was just. I don't think I've ever seen a bigger mismatch between SEC teams in my life, maybe. Um, and I think more concern. I think this was even a better barometer. I watched their ETSU game, which they lost twenty three to three to an FCS team. And they had Joseph Bullivis not hit a field goal on the final play of the game. They lose to UConn, which is, you know, pick your choice. Them or UMass, maybe the worst team in the mm -hmm. FBS a year ago. Uh, and, and look, I, I'm not kidding. I, I thought those teams were stronger and faster, which again, nothing Clark Lee can do about that. That's just what he's left. Uh, but, you know, that that's kind of how far this team has to go to get back to respectability. I, I think Clark Lee is doing a really good job. Uh, I think they're – I thought the hire Barton Simmons was great. Their recruiting has gotten better. Uh, like you guys said, they're winning some battles now that they usually don't win. But that is that is the mountain that they climb going into 2023. Yeah, there's a, there's a long way to go. But uh, obviously they've made the commitment that they need to. And, and Clark Lee being – I think the only way they could go is they had to get a Vanderbilt guy and they got one in, in Clark Lee and he has, you got to have somebody who has a, a genuine, you know, love for that program to go through these steps that they're going to need to, to get back to, you know, maybe the level that they were under, you know, James Franklin at some point uh, down the line, things like that. But, uh, it, it's it's been there done it's been done before it can be done again. It's just a question of, okay, does it take, you know, does it take five years to do it or does it take, you know, eight, nine, 10 years to do it? So uh, we'll see, see how it goes uh, for Vanderbilt, but I uh, definitely think there'll be improvement from year one to year two for Clark Lee. But like I said, it's going to be measured in different ways. Yep. All right. Agreed. Thanks for watching our preview of Vanderbilt's football season. We got two in the books as we're doing this one tonight, 12 more to go. We've hit all the team schedules so far. Watch those. Don't miss anything at our channel. And the way you can do that, hit that subscribe button and follow us. We think you'll love our stuff. we got basketball stuff coming up in a few weeks. But anyway, I'm Chris Lee for Blaine Gilmer and Blake Lovell of Southeastern 14. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you again really soon.